one day I'm going to give up writing and just paint. I'm going to give up painting and just sing. I'm going to give up singing and just sit. I'm going to give up breathing and just die. I'm going to give up dying and just love. I'm going to give up loving and just write. More? More? What? That was uh, Jack Hirschman. And uh, it was a really loving memorial to him done by his wife, uh, Aggie, who you saw in the first, in the first um, uh, part, of the, part of it. Um, the theme for today's program is called Stepping Forward, another poem that you will hear at the end of the program. But Jack died on August 22nd, very suddenly. Uh, he was a mentor to many poets around the world, uh, was a, active in the very first uh, 100,000 Poets for Change. The same year that 100,000 Poets for Change was founded, Jack was also in Colombia in South America um, for the founding convention of world, the World Poetry Movement just a few months before that. So. Uh, Jack's spirit is very much with us in the room as we're talking today. Jack was a profound political poet. Um, stepping forward is probably a metaphor for us today of what we need to do and why the theme, what the theme is really of the reading. So I want to welcome everybody here. Well, this is great. I want to welcome everybody here. Um, we're going to have a really remarkable reading today, and um, I want to introduce my co-host for today's session. Um, Hesu, can you just say hi? Sorry, hi. I forget I'm the co-host. Good to see everybody here. Right. Hesu is, is the co-host today. We're going to split duties. I'm going to take the first half of the program. She's going to take the second half. The first half of the program uh, will end about a little after two, and we'll have about a 10 to 15 minute discussion period. And then uh, we'll go for another 40, 45 minutes, and we'll have another 10 minute or so discussion period, and then we'll close the show. Um, so that's the way things are going to go. Um, I, I'm not going to introduce poets. I will call them out by name. We've got an order of, of, of that they'll be reading in that's pretty well established. Uh, but I just want to make sure that you all know that it's not serendipitous. It's actually been planned. And we'll have a really tremendous reading, I'm sure. Um, and I'm going to ask each poet to say one or two words about themselves, just so we don't have, so I don't have to uh, drag things on. So, without further ado, we're going to kick this thing off with Michelle Salturas. Michelle, take it away. Hi guys, I'm Michelle. Um, I'm a Chicago revolutionary slam poet. Um, the piece I chose to read um, was inspired by when I went to go see Black Panther um, and like some things that happened in the movie theater during that. So here we go. Maybe Black Panther was right. They say oppression is a pyramid built on a foundation of ignorance and harmless jokes and inaction. I'm sitting in the movie theater watching Black Panther and these white kids won't shut up. I watch their mothers watch them run up the aisle and leave. I listen to white boys try to laugh the movie away as though they've already assumed they have that power. Like it's just another superhero movie, just another man in a suit, just another cool comic. I hope 50 freaking shades of gray was a grand old time for you while your children's laughter was drowned by Kendrick's beats. 
you white women with your white boys who fill up space too much, who take too much space that does not belong to you. I hope you know this movie eats at you for its right to exist. I hope you know the pyramid can't stand if the bottom crumbles and your ignorance is the bottom. Sometimes I look at Eric and think he is right. Maybe it's time for minorities to overthrow, assume power rightfully theirs. Sometimes I look at Black Panther and know he's right. Not the colonist, not the imperialist, never will sink to their level. I hope you know, I am chipping away at you every day. Like Eric, I've been accused of loving the wreckage more than the structure. I've been accused of causing the destruction too. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move quickly. Uh, our next poet comes to us all the way from Ontario. Um, thanks to Mary Beth Henry. Uh, Eddie Lartry, Lartry, would you take it away, please? Hi, everyone. I am Eddie Larte, uh, AKA Tupac Shakespeare. Uh, feel free to look me up on Instagram. The darkest pity party. Me and my shadow exchange horror stories about being black. I say to my shadow, I envy you. No one ever questions the quantity of your blackness. You're never too black or not black enough. You are always just simply black without question without interrogation. I envy how your hands have never felt the chill of cuffs, never been presumed guilty until proven dead. Cause no matter how hard they try, they can never kill a shadow. And my shadow says to me, I know what it's like to be a walking chalk outline. A shadow's place is on the ground or against a wall and everything that makes me uniquely beautiful is robbed of me in the nighttime. The warmth of my personality and flesh become the tone of nightmares. This skin, nothing more than the fingerprint of a violent night. They label me an angry black man, based my whole existence on throwing shade and why wouldn't I be angry? I hate the way I stick out in white spaces. I try and comfort my shadow. I say, I wish I knew my history the way you did. I envy how close you are to the earth and our roots. The melanin in a shadow is a vow. You are the origin of black love. Watch how easily it is for two shadows to become one flesh. And I've never known a love like this. I love the way you, you flip the script, appropriate their movements and call it normal. My shadow says, call it conformity, call it being puppeted, call it being spoon fed a culture without spice. Our stark skinned individuals have never been afforded the crown of normalcy, never been given the luxury of tears, even though it's clear. I feel the weight of everything on top of me, even though it's clear. I've been on rock bottom for quite some time now and it's maddening, this code switching and some light shadow has to split itself in two to fit into a workplace where it's tokenized, invisible, present at every board meeting and cannot speak. Our glass ceilings, the floor give new meaning to overshadowed, to be stepped on and stepped over. And we bond over these memories and pre-written destinies. A connection so close, it is almost physical. For our kinship, Siamese-like, brotherhood so real we nod in verification upon meeting one another for even boxers know on some nights all you have is your shadow fighting with you but cops know the best way to make shadows scatter is swirling lights thank you all so much i'm eddie larte aka tupac shakespeare looking up on instagram thank you, thank you. great wow um, next, we want to hear from Kathy Powers, one of my neighbors. Hello, everybody. I don't have a camera. That's why you can't see me. I'm an activist in Chicago and an organizer, and I, I like to write poetry a lot. I changed the poem I was going to read. I'm going to read one of my older poems because this is for in the spirit of Jack Kirsten. It's called, um, remember, a house becomes a home when you can write, I love you on the furniture. Dust if you must, dust if you must, but wouldn't it be better to paint a picture or write a letter, bake a cake 
or plant a seed. Ponder the difference between want and need. Dust if you must, but there's not much time with rivers to swim and mountains to climb. Music to hear and books to read, friends to cherish and life to lead. Dust if you must, but the world's out there with sun in your eyes and wind in your hair. A flutter of snow, a shower of rain, this day will not come around again. Dust if you must, and bear in mind, old age will come, and it's not kind. And when you go, and go you must, you at last become the dust. Thank you. Great. Yes. OK. Um, uh, Luis, how about you? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thanks. It works. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you all uh, so much for the opportunity to present here. Uh, I'm going to read a poem. Um, so I, I probably on the older generation of uh, folks that are on this. Um, I'm not sure if anybody remembers, but here in Chicago in the 1990s, uh, the Bulls uh, won uh, was like six championships. Um, and in the first, the first championship um, and the first couple of championships. There was uh, rioting, or what people called rioting, uh, that took place in the city of Chicago. Uh, but for for me, who was born and raised in the city of Chicago, and I, and I can say that for other people that were born and raised in the city of Chicago, we didn't see it so much as like a negative release, um, more as like a, a joining together. And so this poem is about that. Bulls win, bulls win, bulls win. The whole hood was celebrating. The city turned into a volcano. The joy was lava, melting into every apartment, oozing onto the streets, flowing into the soul. Bulls win, bulls win. The lava was fireworks sprouting toward the sky. Bulls win. The lava was for the years of hurt from the repression and brutality of the cops boiling underneath the earth ready to rain down on CPD, June 1991, the start of the deadliest decade in Chicago. The hot was heavy. The humidity trapped the smell of gun smoke in the air. 600 murders every year and at least a few were for a pair of Jordans. The street gangs controlled the streets with their colors and symbols. But the legal gangs controlled the corners with uniforms and badges, hunting us like the heat, suffocating like the humidity. The 12th of June, 1991, game five. Bulls versus Lakers, air versus magic. Chicago was calm, the windy city would still. Three, two, one. First, you heard the booms and crackles of fireworks exploding with the excitement of car horns like trumpets and trombones, followed by the stampede of the city flowing onto the streets. It was a riot. It was a release. The police cars were on fire and overturned. Bulls win this for the decades of invading our hoods. Bulls win for the times they searched and spat on you. Bulls win with the revolvers aimed at your head. The cold steel of the barrel pressed so hard against your temple, leaving an imprint on your skin. The 12th of June, 1991, the night Chicago won. The 13th of June, 1991. The morning sunlight danced off the shards of glass. Dried blood colored the concrete. A violent silence breezed through the scent of resistance in the half court alleys. For just a couple of hours, we won. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. I'm going to call on Eric Allen Yankee.
Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Uh, this poem is called Cabin Fever Hallucinations. I saw America descend into Cthulhu's watery grave, and the great beast writhed in the abyss and pulled the whole thing under, all of it. The stockbrokers wearing black, preparing for their funerals and surviving on the gnarled bodies they will soon become. The president tweeting in his yellow stained suit while riding the waves of the new White House bidet. The candidate seeking to replace him, coming unglued at the seams of his jaw and failing to make a single sound as the swirling tentacles overtake his mouth. The mummies running out to prep for their return to the tombs by hoarding all the precious toilet paper. The old folks screaming in the night about how Ronald Reagan is still wearing his cowboy hat and making it rain prosperity with his pro-life bullets and the gun Nancy's ghost has to sling over his shoulder each day. I saw America pack up and leave because only mad beasts would cling to such a life. Part two. I saw America offer to send checks. I saw America offer to leave the lights on. I saw America offer to suspend interest. I saw America offer everyone cheap flights. I saw America offer to house the unhoused. I saw America offer to unchain office workers while leaving grocery staff at the front lines. I saw America threaten to go back to work and spit in Cthulhu's face. You don't fucking spit in Cthulhu's face. Part three. I saw Napoleon waiting for me at Longwood House. He was clutching his stomach and shouting that the time has come to prepare the invasion and bring the ancient ones to their knees. Good luck, Napoleon. You're going to need it. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have a special treat now. Um, they call on Babir, Babir Balu. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm Babir Belos, a uh, longtime organizer, activist. Um, I'm also interested in art and poem as well, but as much as like you guys, <laughs> this has been really great. Uh, I'm going to read a poem by one of my favorite poets, uh, Nazim Hikmet. Uh, he's been he's been a, a, like a guiding light for in the past for our struggle, but also I think the times that we're living in has been even much more uh, dominant that we can take a lot more from him at this point. The name of the poem is A Set State of Freedom. You waste the attention of your eyes, the glittering labor of your hands, and you need the dough enough for dozens of loaves, of which you'll taste another morsel. You are free to slay for others. You are free to make the rich richer. The moment you are born, they plan around you, mills that grind lies, lies to last you a lifetime. You keep thinking in your great freedom, a finger on your temple, free to have a free conscience. Your head bent as if half cut from the nape, your arms long, hanging, your center above in your great freedom. You are free with the freedom of being unemployed. You love your country as the nearest, most precious thing to you. But one day, for example, they may endorse it over to America. And you too, with your great freedom, you have the freedom to become an air base. You may proclaim that must one must live not as a tool, number of a link, but as a human being. And at once they hang up your wrist, you are free to be arrested, imprisoned, and even hanged. There's neither an iron, wooden, nor tool curtain in your life. There's no need to choose freedom, you are free. But this kind of freedom is a set affair under the stars. Thank you very much. Do you have that in Turkish also? Oh, I do believe so, but I just don't have it written. I think I save it somewhere on the 
internet as a recorder somewhere. But I have to double check. Okay. If okay, good enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Babir and I have bonded over a, the love for Nazim Hikmet. So if nothing else, it's certainly that. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but it's a whole lot of other things too. That's definitely. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I'm going to ask um, one of my favorite San Francisco poets to read something now, uh, Sarah Menifee. Hi, very pleased to be part of this wonderful celebration. Um, I'm going to, I'm a longtime friend and comrades of Jack Hirschman, still am. Uh, I'm going to read a poem of his from Endless Threshold, one of his books from the early 90s. Um, this was, uh, the occasion of this was some uh, really serious um, uh, censorship of culture that was going on at that time. It still goes on. This is um, Organize the Heart by Jack Hirschman. When a woman is eating out of a garbage can, not a woman in a poem eating out of a garbage can, not a woman in a painting or film eating out of a garbage can, when a woman is eating out of a garbage can, that's censorship. A woman eating out of a garbage can or curled up in a doorway, a man sprawled out on a sidewalk, a child in a cardboard hovel, are censorship victims of a system of competitive profiteering, more obscene than the most obscene image imaginable. More rabid in its barking for lucre, than the most tawdry porn recordable. When a woman has to eat out of a garbage can and a man rummage the night for a rag of space and a child shiver with bowl or cup for coins, all poems, all paintings and films, whatever their content, drop to the street, organize the heart to resist the smug and vicious indifference of systemic decay parading as virtue. Become house, beds, warm food, good cheer, first in the heart's solitude, then in the mind's collective demand, then with bodies, unanimous storm, transform censorship into the liberty that never stops housing and feeding all. Jack Hirschman. Great. And if I can find it here, I'm going to read a very short poem that I wrote for him. Great. Yes, please. Okay, this is called Ruach, which means, uh, I guess that's Hebrew, it means um, breath and spirit. Now I understand one, what this windy, windy year did portend Ruach, Ruach, or Jack. Great soul, great song, you international. Then comes the rains and the tears. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is Ben Viagran here? I haven't seen him come in. I just He is next on our list. Um, we're actually very far ahead of where we were planning on being at this point. Uh, what I can do out uh, is move myself into this spot. I'll read something and then we'll break for discussion. Um, we can always fit uh, Ben in later if he comes in. Um, the poem I want to read is also older. Uh, it's called Ode to a Laughing Man, and somehow it seems particularly appropriate at this point when so much devastation is going on. Ode to a Laughing Man. The morning light, still before dawn, filters through the windows, creeps around the table, the chairs, the end of the bed, 
lets me see their shape as if in the night their edges had all softened, become indistinct. And the breeze ripples lightly across my skin, bringing with it intense sweet fragrance from the lilacs in the courtyard. I love watching the early morning light define my surroundings. I love inhaling this late May scent that has since childhood signified pleasure. And still, and then, the light reveals bodies of the bombed. The fragrance cannot hide the stench of sewage in our waters. This morning and yesterday and probably tomorrow, I think of Bertolt Brecht writing, ah, what an age it is when to speak of trees is almost a crime for it is a kind of silence about injustice. I love to walk into the garden where the purple salvia run riot, interrupted by pink columbines at play. Magenta spiderworts wave at me in the wind. And my neighbor stops to gossip about pasta and peonies. And we laugh about the advancing violets, even about the dandelions about their bitter greens in a salad. We smile, we laugh, and laugh. He who laughs has not yet heard the terrible tidings. Bresh wrote that too. I've heard the terrible tidings. And yet I speak of trees because after capitalism, that is what we will do. It's a crime to dwell on capitalist depravity, its descent into fascism, without envisioning what's possible and necessary, what needs to be accomplished by the only ones who can. There is but one reason to talk about doom. Comrade, only slaves can free you. Everything or nothing, all of us or none. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we have reached a, a point at which we had set aside in this in the program for discussion. It's a bit earlier than we'd intended, but that's okay. Um, and we can start out. Uh, this is open to everybody in the uh, in this. Uh, in our room right now, as it as it were. Uh, so, if you are, if you have something you want to ask or say, uh, this is the time to do it. I'd like to start with some of the poets to see what they thought, what they they have any questions or comments they want to make in this first session. And I'm going to start it out by saying by by saying that the piece that Luis read reminded me not so much not so much in style, but just uh, and uh, I guess in the last month especially I've been thinking a lot about Jack Hirschman, but in in the piece that Luis read, um, read reminded me about his two poems about Haiti, and in particular his baseball poem about Haiti. Uh, Jack was a great lover of baseball, and we would talk about baseball. Uh, occasionally when we would meet. Uh, he particularly liked the Cleveland Indians, not so much because the, of their name, but because of the fact that, that they had uh, early on in their, um, uh, in their existence, uh, uh, <laughs> made in Haiti. May, uh, Sarah, may, um, maybe I'll ask you to read that as soon as, uh, but I think, you know, this, this is, uh, well, yeah, he, when you're ready. Yeah, what 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 he did was he he uh, in terms of the Indians, uh, he uh, he loved the Cleveland team because they had drafted uh, the first Jewish players, and, and so Hank Greenberg was a big star. Later on, Al Rosen, but also Larry Doby, uh, one of the premier players uh, in in baseball, it really isn't given very much uh, enough credit. 
uh, so a black player. So I, I think um, so it was it, that the, the way in which uh, you um, contrasted the uh, the bulls um, uh, the exuberance of, of the victory with the with the history of, of defeat is really was really beautiful. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that definitely was my intention. I think that um, anytime that you have a release like that, um, sometimes it may be violent, but anytime that there's a release like that, it's because the people have, have been feeling oppressed in some type of way or form. Um, and so they're, they're, they're releasing. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's more of a reaction to um, the system that have been in place against them for generations. Um, and I was hoping to capture that and make it fun <laughs> and make it like, you know, and do a little throwback uh, at the same time too, throw some pop, pop culture in there um, for, uh, for all those people out there. But thanks, thanks. I appreciate the, the kind words about the, about the piece and the comparison too. Sarah, could you read that piece? I'm sorry? So you yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to. Jack and I, he, he loved baseball and he played baseball dice at the bar. And, you know, he he loved uh, the Detroit Tigers. I forget the name of the of the player with them that back in the 40s that he loved. So he always like was faithful to the Tigers. So whenever they were in town, we'd go over to the Oakland to the stadium and watch them in the night games. It was so much fun because it was made him so happy. So, um, you know, boy, if he saw, oh God, what would he say if he saw the scenes playing out right now with the brutality that they're doing against against these poor Haitian um People fleeing the war, the you know the assassination that we're that we're promoting there, and the the, the plunder. Uh, so this is about the plunder, and this this book is from the '80s. So this is you know what keeps on going. This is called Made in Haiti. Made in Haiti, the ball so much depends upon by a poor black woman who earns $2.60 a day for making a dozen of them. A woman like the pregnant worker shot by Duvalier goons or the one spray shot for protesting her death in Ganaves while all other parties but Duvalier's have been outlawed. 40,000 in a stadium here the whole population of Gonave cheer the movement of the little ball with Made in Haiti on it. Inside it, the Cecil is packed like a population in prison, a hungry weeping that literally beggars the imagination and a core of revolutionary struggle that will burst imperialism stitches and make that island there as its wondrous people. Jack Hirschman Presente. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else uh, 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 have anything you want to ask or, or say in this section? We have a few more, we have maybe about 10 more minutes. And feel free to comment. If you don't want to read your question out loud, we can read it for you. Go ahead and use the chat. I want to go back to Luis's uh, poem about the bulls and being a Chicagoan. You made it so alive. I could feel it. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed at all. It was great. It was great. I, I started thinking about the, uh, the uh, Democratic Convention, too, and the riots then. I mean, Chicago just keeps on ticking, I'll tell you that. It's going to happen again, right? <laughs> right. I want to say, I noticed in, in the chat um, that uh, we have Carlos Mor uh, Morales Rosales from uh, 
Atlantic Canada, the Atlantic side of Canada. So thank you for, for joining us today. Lou, I wanted to respond to Eric's poem. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I love, you know, Eric knows I'm a huge fan. But his America poems and how he personifies America always hits hard. And there was the line in the second part, of course, I forgot now, that was just so hilarious. Um, I love the humor that's interweaved it in there, but the criticism is just right on point. And I, I just I just love the work. Um, really great piece. And I uh, hope to hear another one if we have time. So thank you, Eric. Anybody else want to ask or say something, please don't don't be shy. We can uh can I ask my nerdy question? Go ahead, ask your question. So I I I in fact I was thinking about this poem as I was, I mean this question as I was revising my own poem. And and uh, we talked about this before talk about this with my students, talk about this, in fact, Eric and Adam and others. And the question is this, a lot of you have this, this very um, beautiful, poignant political point within your piece. Do you, does that point emerge organically or do you have that point in mind as you write the poem? Does that make sense? Sure. Anybody want to chime in? Take a stab at it. Go ahead, Michelle. So usually if I have something that's really heated politically, um, I like got really pissed off about something. <laughs> um, and that kind of like yeah. sparks um, no. me writing a piece from it. It just kind of like comes out of me. It's kind of like my way of like even dealing with it, I wanna say. Like, I need to do something about this. So I guess I'm gonna perform this piece everywhere and tell everyone about it <laughs> sort of deal. So, but I do remember like, one of the things one of my poetry professors told me a long time ago was that like, anything can really be political if you're trying to like get across some sort of like point. Um, Cause I had a lot of pieces when I was putting together my chat book that I was like, they're not really politically charged. And he was like, if you're trying to like stand up for people then I would consider that politically charged. So I think it just depends, but definitely like taking from like just your experience and just putting it on the page. And uh, Eric is on stack. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, I'm with Michelle in that um, usually when I'm writing a piece, it's because I've gotten really pissed off about something. Um, I used to watch uh, Fox News just for that purpose, just so I could upset myself enough to write. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but um, sometimes it emerges organically. You know, the piece that I read today, um, I wrote it when I was like, you know, laying on my couch with a 104 degree fever from COVID and just like, yeah. You know, so so part of it was uh, it was motivated by that is watching our country's response to uh, response to COVID initially, because that was back in March of when it all began. Um, and so, yeah, part of it was being pissed off about it. And the other part was just emerging organically, just commenting on the things that I was seeing around me, like why were you know office workers were set free but you know so-called frontline workers yeah i you know i.e people who were forced to be frontline workers who who uh um, not necessarily doctors but like people you know just working in grocery stores if you're working in a grocery store you, that doesn't mean you want to be on the front line <laughs> you didn't volunteer to be on the front line for that you know so that's kind of where that comes from. And uh, Kathy, who, by the way, I love all your poetry, but um, Kathy says, there was no more there, sorry. I write my best political material at midnight, almost when I'm ready to sleep. 
Then I go to sleep around 6 a.m. Pissed off does it. Thanks, Kathy. Um, if there's time, I'll uh, say something. Go ahead. All right. Um, well, uh, I wanted to- Who are you? Oh, I'm Adam. Uh, pronouns are here, they, um, Chicago poet, um, one of the uh, co-founders of the Chicago Revolutionary Poets Brigade, which hasn't done uh, a lot in a while, but I want to mention that because it's part of Jack's legacy, who's the, you know, co-founder of the original Revolutionary Poets Brigade in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, oh. I, I, I got on stack to talk about something else, but briefly in answer to the, the wonderful question, Hesu, um, uh, I think I, I always have an idea of what I want to say, but the process and practice of putting it into words uh, deepens and uh, shifts my thinking um, and clarifies it. And I think that speaks to what I wanted to say also, which is about the vision and, and the clarity that poetry can give us and that Jack... Um, you know, just to say a few words in memory of him, had so much to say on this topic, on the particular role of poetry in revolutionary change, um, art generally, and poetry in particular, precisely because of this visionary power that poetry has. And I just wanted to respond to the poem that Sarah shared of his that struck me so powerfully about a woman eating from a garbage can is censorship. And what that line does is it undoes the censorship of thinking that that is the reality we must accept. And by naming it in such evocative, eloquent, um, heart-wrenching terms, um, we see a vision beyond that to a world where that is not even possible or thinkable. And that vision negates the censorship of a ruling class who has c captured all of us in their own imagination of the world and censored our natural imaginations of the world. And um, on that note of censorship and its profound implications and the relationship between politics and poetry, um, I wonder if someone who has one of Jack Hirschman's books could read at some point another poem that I have never been able to find online in full, which is the poem titled The Painting, about a, a pretty ugly, hateful painting of Mayor Harold Washington that um, was uh, hung, I think, in the Art Institute um, in the 80s. Uh, and... Uh, Jack, Jack wrote a great poem about that, um, also in relationship to like this idea of censorship, which is sometimes appropriated by the right whenever hate speech is attacked or shut down, right? Um, if anyone has access to that poem, I would certainly love to hear it today and just invite that. That's all. Thank you. Hey, Rand. The unmute button. I'd just like to relate to you. Um, I'm not a poet, I'm a musician. The most important type, I play bass. And right behind me is where I live up on the lake shore of Michigan, uh, South Chicago, southwest of me here. But years ago, back in the late 70s, I played the role of a bodyguard to a famous poet, Dennis Brutus. And you know, I didn't talk to him much. I was standing in the corner just looking for trouble. But one thing that he said when he was recounting being interrogated by those in London was, Dennis, why do you always talk about oppression? Why do you always talk about and write about South Africa and such? And it always struck me for any of the arts, he says, you got to know what you're talking about, what you're writing about. you got to know it. And this is one subject I know. Awesome. So uh, a couple of comrades have the painting. Um, Lisbeth, do you want to read it? Yeah, if I could 
read it now. Yeah, um, please go ahead. I have to get on another Zoom in a minute, a couple of minutes. Um, it's an endless threshold, a painting. So there it is, a painting of the late black heroic mayor of Chicago in women's underwear in the name of artistic iconoclasm and free expression and constitutional liberty and individual civil rights. And there they are at last, the city aldermen taking it off the walls, removing it from the exhibition in the name of the working masses whose constitutional liberties and free expression and civil rights have been smothered, censored, bribed, shunted, overlooked, and now whose hero, heroes are made into kitsch, pornographied, transvesticized, to reflect the most cheap shot, degrading and racially humiliating business as usual nation on earth, well, what do you say? Were they wrong to remove the painting of the progressive mayor who led the working people toward destruction of a rotting fascist machine that wants to reassert its disgusting oppression now that Harold Washington is dead? But, 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 but removing a painting, but, but, but the artist's individual, the artist's individual, the artist's individ, the artist's indiv, the artist in, what, 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 what about the artist? What about the class? Provo, 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 provocation is the essence of art. Provocation for what, Mr. Curator, Mr. Institutional Curator, Mr. Corporate Funded Institutional Curator, Mr. Elite Corporate Funded Institutional Curator, provocation for what? But, but, but what about the empty wall space, the violation of the artist, the damage to culture? You are the empty wall space, Mr. Curator. You are the violation of the artist and the damage to culture. David Nelson painted mirth and girth out of the hundred twisted fantasies of the sleaze of politics and the politics of sleaze, of the terror of the sex of blackness and the blackness of sex fantasies used by capitalism secretly through racist aesthetics or openly through the markets of porn to displace imagination with a price to keep artists and workers alike filthy in their purity, paralyzed in dirty minded liberty, fugitives from humanity, di human dignity and political struggle, stupefied when confronting collective life or revolutionary action. We are partisan, Mr. Make It Curator, and you, Mr. Make It New Artist, we're at war with art as privilege, with the kitching up of the soul, with the gooning of the truth about those who help working people see how beautiful the reality of their imagination as a class in motion actually is. Do we acclaim the removal of the painting Emphatically, provocatively, yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and thank you, Adam, for suggesting that. Um, I wanted to add one other thing in, uh, in regard to the 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 um, censorship of. Uh, I mean, I think I think the poem that that Sarah read um, of the woman eating out of the the, the uh, trash can. I think the first three lines of that are really very powerful, um, because partly because it says not just that there's a woman eating out of a trash can, but Think about it for a minute. This is not a story of a woman eating out of a trash can. This is not something in a fantasy. This is real life that something like this is happening. It just emphasizes that, of that censorship. I kind of wanted to say, uh, to compare that for a moment 
with a with a pretty famous uh, sentence from Nelson Algren. Uh, it's a kind of contrasting sentence, and it's what I think every everything that Jack wrote is is literature is made upon any occasion that a challenge is put to the legal apparatus by a conscience in touch with humanity. And I think that's really, I mean, Jack's literature transcended the page, transcended the voice, existed every time he read into a, a group of homeless people or worked with that. Um, it, 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 Sarah transcends the, her marvelous written words every time she works, uh, has worked with Food Not Bombs and the various organizations she's worked with over the years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Union, Union of the Homeless, huh, Adam? Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. That's the original. Made. Yeah, That's Jack was in on that. So and 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 actually, and so I think that's that's really it's an interesting contrast. I think it's important to see, and I love the fact that that when Algren says that, he doesn't say uh, he he isn't he does not limit it to the written word. It's any time a challenge is put to the legal apparatus by the a conscience in touch with humanity. Um, all right. It's now very close to two o'clock. I think we should go on to that second section and I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, uh, Dr. Estrada. No, just Jesus fine. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that was awesome. So it is my pleasure. Oh, Comrade Adam, you're up next. All right. Um, wow. Loving the fire and vitality and fast pace of this um, reading. The poetry was just like fireworks in the first half, and the discussion was really rich and wonderful. I'm going to take a few little breaths to get grounded here. <laughs> <laughs> How, how is my sound, incidentally? Sound is great. Sound good? Sounds good. Yep. Okay. Awesome. I'll uh, drop my Facebook and Instagram handles in the chat and encourage others to do the same. The main one I use is my band's handle, at Adam Gottlieb and One Love. And here we go. And I'll dedicate this to Jack. Jubilee Year. This is our year of jubilee. This year we issue our decree that now from sea to shining sea, all vacant bank-owned homes are free. This is our year of jubilee. This year, the wealth that usually is kept and hoarded brutally is shared for all communally. This is the year we all agree our only healthcare policy is make it free and quality, that life is no commodity. This year we heed our memory and hear the Anishinaabe and honor every broken treaty right down to Mini Wachoni. This is our year of Jubilee. The land at last is now redeemed and we the people will be free. This is our year of Jubilee. This is the year that poetry breaks through the chains of legalese and flows and waves throughout the streets in song and chants and prophecy. This is our year of jubilee. All debts are now hereby relieved and prisoners are hereby free from sea to shining fucking sea. This is our year of jubilee and rights of private property are no defense for profiteering off of death and poverty. This is our year of jubilee. The deaf will hear, the blind will see. This is the year eternity is born again into the seed from which it sprouted, up and outward. This is our world. This is we, the people, land, and life itself taking back the deed that rightfully was always ours. Whether with arms or open arms, the revolution is now born and must arrive as surely as the sky that sings the dawn. My friends, the end of night is now upon us. 
hear and near, feel it, power. This is ours. This is our year. This hour, now. All right. Okay, Bonnie Contreras. Hey. Uh, Bonnie also helped inspire that poem, um, as those who know her will will know. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bonnie Contreras. I am the president of the Chicago Union of the Homeless. I am formerly unhomeless. I'm in the house now. This poem that I'm about to read is dedicated to my fallen comrade, Noreen Litbit Moorhead. It's called The Life of Homeless People. I have to steal to get by. I have to panhandle to get by. Where's my house? Where's my food? I get tired of sandwiches and fruit. I like mashed potatoes, greens, and steak, and sometimes something besides chicken. I try to keep warm with blankets and clothes, but we're still we're still dying because not because that's not enough. I hate seeing people live in hallways and doorsteps and in tents. Where is their housing? Give us all housing. How many homeless have to die before somebody step in? To me, this is modern day genocide. Who's, who's gonna pay the elderly and homeless? Help save us. All right. Right, that's awesome, thank you. Fantastic. So uh, we, I put Neo uh, in this uh, spot, and he's going. Felipe to wanted to say a poem too. He's the sergeant at arms of the home, Chicago Union of the Homes. All right. Does he want to go right after you? Go ahead, Felipe. Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Hey, how's it um, going? I'm Felipe. Um. So yesterday was the going home of home going of no rain a little bit more ahead. And I read a poem there yesterday and it was one of her own and, and, and she was a great poet and, and a beautiful leader. Um, so today I wanna read, it's called So Tired by Noreen a little bit more ahead. She said, so tired of not having food, so tired of not having heat, so tired of the BS that goes on, so tired, so tired. God grant me the strength to keep fighting when no one else does. Bless me, Lord, with your grace and mercy that I can continue to fight. I'm tired. I'm tired. Somebody please help me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, Neo, going to read a poem by uh, Jack Krishman. Neo, you still here? I think he may have dropped out. Oh, no, there he is. Neo? Okay, we'll come back to him. Um, Mars? Halton, are you here, Mijo? Oh, here he is. I am. Greetings. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Hey. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Okay. This is called Harriet. You'd probably say otherwise, but I doubt you would like Harriet. Sneaking around at night, pistol on her hip, threatening to shoot you if you started some, I can't do this shit. That little five foot nothing sister took everybody she could on road trips on foot to the dark on Saturday nights, giving her guests 36 hours to run before Monday's runaway slave notices hit the newspapers. My mother wanted her daughters to attend college unlike her. Used to snap at us, don't act smart. But Harriet used her intelligence like a secret weapon acting slow and simple, if that would throw a slave owner off her trail. Pretending to read the paper, cause word was this Moses was illiterate. And choosing the coldest winter days 
when Southern folks were huddling inside. You would have complained about it being too cold, that the food was nasty, that there were at least meals and cots back on the plantation. All that shishing she did, all that wading in the water to hide your scent and never getting paid, never settling down in the North, making people go all the way into Ontario. Damn, that was just too much. She would have gotten on your last nerve. But when she came back to you a year later, bringing you your husband and your children, I hope you would have changed your mind. I remember what Jam Donaldson said in Jet, that she's a proud millennial who refuses dogma, laughing that half the time she thinks political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal probably is guilty anyway, just keeping it real. She brushed off the MOVE supporters who criticized her for it as if her opinion was just as valid as Ramona Africa's, the only adult who survived the bombing of the group's home in 1985, or as Pam Africa, who left law school to support the cause of black love, natural law, the environment, and the rights of all humans to a decent, healthy, and just life. Sister Pam and Sister Ramona two heroes of our time, still fighting for the release of not just their imprisoned move family, but all people behind bars for the crime of standing, speaking for freedoms. Now, how about that Ruby Bridges and her mother with all that chaos just to attend the school they wanted? Were you one of those people who preferred to just keep your head down and learn to love Northern segregation? Would you, after watching 500 white families yank their kids out of school, riot in the streets outside, fight the National Guard, hollers inches away into the faces of black children, would you have let your daughter or son decide for themselves whether to continue this struggle, even though your courage wilted in the face of danger to your baby? But many of those mothers did, and so did their children. And I attended strong working class, racially integrated public schools because of each of them, heroes. Yes, it is easier to adore Alice when she writes of love and her Southern culture, of education's transforming power. Easier when she is at the podium in graying dreads and robes, inspiring college graduates to dream big and fight bigger. Much easier to love her than when she texts us from the boat headed to Gaza to challenge the Israeli embargo, challenging you and I to see the beauty in Palestine and the horror of being encircled like America's indigenous tribes being pushed into smaller and smaller, less and less fertile lands because someone else's religion says they deserve the good stuff. Did you share those tweets? Sent as her fellow peaceful protesters watched armed guards bowed their boat, then arrest them for the crime of trying to bring food and medicine into Gaza. If there is a hero in you, she smiles and stands with a fist in the air for Harriet, <laughs> for Pam and Ramona, for Alice and for Audra, for every mother who changes the world by the way she raises her children. We're stealing her back when freedom staggers. We are heroes when we take the place of the ones who fought and for whom we are grateful. We ain't gone under yet because love bites. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Oh. All right. Uh, up next, uh, Damiana Aldonova, are you here? How about uh, Vince Romero? He isn't here either yet. 
Neo, are you back? Okay. Neil said uh, they were having trouble connecting to audio. Who did, Neil? Yeah, or getting their microphone to work. Okay, but well, we have time if you can figure it out or they can figure it out by uh, by um, uh, when we're done. Okay, so I'm actually up next. <laughs> and uh, this is a whip uh, I dedicated to Lori Lightfoot. I don't know if Kathy's still on. So we've been in the fight for our lives and for our kids. And uh, it's been really stressful because my, you know, I, I don't know at what point these, these capitalists, these politicians are going to give a shit about the people who have died, the children who are in hospitals, and uh, they don't seem to want to move to do what's right. So I keep tweeting at Lori every day. She's probably blocked me by now, but it's just, just a very unconscionable what's happening in our public school systems across the country. So this is called Our, our Children's Feet Like Stars. And originally I wrote it for a poet friend of mine, Jay Mehta, who died uh, two years ago and was probably one of the kindest, most wonderful poets I'd ever met and died, died too soon. He was about my age. Our children's feet like stars will guide us down infinite paths of love beyond the scope of CPS putrefaction, beyond Lori Lightfoot stealing COVID funds, beyond the commercial din of consumption, beyond this disease ravishing young kids, vaccines for profit, politicians for profit, CPS for profit, our children consume for profit, a disease born of an older disease. And I got to spotlight myself, hold up. The recording's gonna be weird. Sorry, my bad, my bad. It was showing you, Adam. Okay, vaccines for profit, politicians for profit, CPS for profit, our children consume for profit, a disease born of an older disease. Our children born of us will march towards a better world, setting hard hearts free, dancing towards new planets, freeing mouths from cannibalizing, freeing mouths from lying, liberating, liberating, liberating our children traversing down these roads alight with angelic discourse towards a world within our reach our children will guide us down infinite paths of love, teaching us to be human once more, teaching us what matters to live and truly die for. And we, we will walk side by side into the possible. So that's for you, Lori. <laughs> All right. Um, Neo, uh, did, if you got your sound to work, if you, you're welcome to read, to read the piece. Otherwise, we're going to open up for, uh, for a discussion. And if poets want to ask questions of each other, or thank you, Sarah, or if people want to, um, you know, comment, that'd be great. <laughs> Sorry. It's Kathy says, going. oh, I got to move my spot. You go, okay. you go, you go. No, I'm just laughing at the comment. So Kathy and I are comrade in arms and Kathy says she doesn't read what people send her. Have you ever tried to send her email? Bounce, bounce, bounce. <laughs> nice one. Um, I was just saying it still shows you as mute, Neo. So I don't know if the problem is as simple as that, but that would be the first step is <laughs> unmuting Neo. All right, well, uh, let's open it up. About the murder of our children, of our families. This is not just in Chicago. This is worldwide. I'm what I'm reading. I'm reading everything I possibly can, and this is this. It's, I've read the dusting poem merely to point out there's there are things other than than fighting and stuff to survive. There are things things to do. There is some joy in life, and they're stripping our joy. They're stripping our life, and uh hearing that that mother uh, and the uh, webinar weeping weeping she's so worried about sending her children to school and 
you know, what you're going to do if they don't give a remote option. Uh, kind, kind of interestingly, they had a, 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 a alderman meeting, and they wouldn't let them do it. They wouldn't let them do it remotely either. So maybe they haven't paid their Comcast bill. <laughs> I don't know what her problem is. But our mayor, our mayor, oh my God, our mayor. I want to see a picture of her, her up, up. Uh, looking like how she well she kind of do you know what they they're calling her now on the internet they're calling her beetlejuice because she kind of you know she kind of she kind of looks like when beetlejuice was like sitting there being all all what he's being yeah 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 i thought you'd like that i want to share that we have <laughs> beetlejuice is the mayor of chicago there you go you know what kathy truth I saw that in a comment because she was doing a press conference and I didn't get it until now. I was like, Beetlejuice, what the hell does that have to do with anything we're fighting for? I just like, <laughs> now I'm not going to be able to get the image out of my head. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, that made my day. Whew, it's just so rough. Uh, I, I did want to comment on Adam's poem. I think I've, I've read it, I've seen you perform it. And the line that grabs me because, you know, um, we want to stay in this fight for the for the long haul, but this is our time. This is our moment, and I I think we really have to rest on that the possibility, right? That think things can get better if we unite, and I keep saying this not not to be. Like if we don't get in the streets and fight for our kids, then what are we gonna fight for? You know. But that line brings me so much hope, Adam. Um, and and I just thank you for it because I, I I love it. I, I needed to hear it today. You know. Thank you, Hesu. Um, if I may uh, just briefly respond to that, I wanna invoke Martina Spada too, who's another um, person. Who I've learned a lot from and who has a lot to say about the um, you know particular power of poetry to express the vision of the people and what he calls the political imagination um, and wrote a well-known poem uh, called imagine the angels of bread which uses the refrain this is the year Mm. And there's something so powerful about calling the change in within like the year, you know, this is the year. And it's become a tradition for me to share some version of that prophetic, poetic um, message with uh, my Jewish congregation, Sedek Chicago. Um, and so I read Jubilee Year um, this year, just a few weeks ago or uh, a couple weeks ago for Rosh Hashanah. And um, the paradox is that we have to imagine it is this year, but we have to renew that, <laughs> that promise every year, that every year, this is the year. Um, I don't know how to say it m better than through poetry, but that, that paradox to me is like kind of what revolution is all about, is, is imagining um, you know, all the possibilities right now, this year, and renewing that constantly, continually, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, that's beautiful, and I love it, because it's so hopeful, and yeah, you're right, we got to keep committing. So, Mars says, um, we need to keep telling people about Lightfoot's blind eye towards children, and her collusion with both CPS and the CPD, but I will never call a person of color a degrading nickname, especially about her appearance. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but I'm sorry, it was laughing because I just now got the joke. Uh, somebody else? Can I say something? Um, Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things. One is that I, I, uh, I think we are, I, I want to comment on the moment that we're in, which I think Adam's poem speaks to brilliantly. And the moment that we're in, or that our children are in, that your poem speaks really brilliantly about, but also the 
history that's brought us to this moment, which is what I think Mars poem is about. It's really, a, I mean, there's a continuation here that we should pay attention to. The other thing I wanted to say is the uh, one of the other readers today was going to be Ben Viagran. Um, I, I, I just want to say that I've known Ben for about 30 years, practically from when I first got to Chicago. Um, ben was a clerk in the Kinkos across the street from where um, Guild Books was. And we bonded over the Xerox machine. Uh, <laughs> helping me with stuff. And he'd come over to the bookstore and you know, buy political books and we would talk. And we've had a friendship ever since. He's from Guatemala and was going to read something by Adam Rene Castillo in, in Spanish as well as in English. I think it goes very well with what your poem was, Hesu. And I wanted to read that if you don't mind. No, not at all, go ahead, we got time. It's called Return to the Smile. And um, yeah, well, it's, it was written in East Germany where he had gone in exile from Guatemala. He ran afraid for his life because of the, the dictatorship there. He ultimately went back to Guatemala and was burned at the stake by the, by the, uh, by the, the government when they caught him. Um, Return to the Smile, Adam Rene Castillo. The children born at the end of the century will be joyful. Their smiles are the collective smile. I, a man struggling in the middle of the century, say at the end of it, the children will be joyful, will return once again to laughter, be born again in gardens. From my bitter darkness, I emerge and project from my hard times, and I see the end of the way. Happy children, only happy, appearing and rising like a sun of butterflies after a heavy tropical shower. The children have inundated the world with their song. I see it today. 1957, in the middle of the 20th century, in a distant American country, in the corn's cradle, from my rugged time, I see a child's face inundated with great collective and wild happiness. I see happy children surrounded by examiners, hungry cops, and fearful functionaries. And I am happy in my everyday prison, filled with houses and streets, whips and hunger, because I see the sunrise full of flowers, tinsel and toys. I'm happy for the future child, whose agile new stature I carry and guard in my pauper's heart. I'm happy with my joy because nothing can stop the children born at the end of the 20th century, from living under different conditions, under another profound wind. I'm happy for the future child of the world, and I proclaim it with a great shout full of universal joy. And the translator of that was Jack Hirschman. That is gorgeous. I don't think I hadn't read that piece. That's beautiful. And, and Jack, Jack to me was hands down my favorite Pablo Neruda translator, haven't seen his equal, and I read a lot of translated poetry. Absolutely, thanks, Lou. That that was gorgeous. Who was that by? Otto Rene Castillo. Mm -mm -mm. Awesome. All right, somebody else want to uh, pick on a different thread or Carlos? How about you? You're a poet. Carlos is a Latin American poet. I don't know if you want to res uh, respond or. Hello. <laughs> hola, hola. Hola. Yes, if you allow me to read a, a couple of my poems, that would be great. Lou, I'm cool with that. We got space. Sure, go ahead. Si okay. en español y en inglés. Okay, I'm going to read a 
uh, some of my poems that are part of, of an anthology, if you don't mind. That's fine. And I love your shirt. <laughs> okay. My voice okay. All shirt. That's great. Okay. Okay. The uh, first one is, uh, I do not like. I do not like the blue looks of these strange people. Blend with no taste for joy and indigestion for arrogance. Because they only invite one to drown in the whiteness of the snow in the price of the merchandise and anxiously I bury myself in the depth of the dark and loving skins. Okay, that's one point. Cool. Okay, next one, bisected by the call. Bisected by the call, my hands whimpered. I remember that little piece of plane nailed to my heart that the surgeons haven't touched yet. It invades me without any previous declaration of what the news would say. That uh, soft green taste of tender mango and the soft blue that the soul painted before I turned off the lights. And uh, I keep an eye out in case a lover steals my clothes and shoes, but it's useless because I will return. Okay, that's the second one. And the third one. The fatherland seems so far away. The fatherland seems so far away. You don't hear anything about it. Hardly anything. Sadly. Not how it's doing. Not who it's with. They say it's nasty. Messy. Without solution. They say so many things. So you'll nourish your count sadness that succumbs every now and then, have broken from all the hope you cling to. The further line is far away because there is nothing wrong with it for a time. The scavengers run the show. Please do what's possible to hold it close. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. I, I love that line for a time the scavengers run the show. That That's just gorgeous. Um, <laughs> sorry, we're having a, a we're going to send poetry to Lightfoot. Um, I, uh, I, you know, it's gonna sound random, but when when I when I wrote that piece and revised it, like for example, I heard beautiful metaphors, um, like of love and and whatnot. Do, do you as poets um, struggle with writing? Okay, y'all had that creative writing teacher, right? That told you not to write cliches. Do you ever find the struggle that you're maybe using a cliche or, you know, because because part, part of me didn't want to write about love, but that's what it's about, right? Um, love and and um, these these concepts that I, I think may, maybe a creative writing teacher may say are cliche, but speak true to to um, to what I was going for in this piece. You know what I mean? Is there, uh, Vince Romero just came in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on to that thought. Vince, welcome. Wait till he, we can hear his sound.
Vince, can you hear us okay? Or Vincent, my bad. I don't know why I'm calling you Vince. Am I muted? Oh, there you're you perfect. How are you? Hi. Whenever you're ready, Vincent, you're up next. Oh, man. Perfect timing. <laughs> perfect. Okay, this, I'm at the, um, the uh, powwow here in Chicago, up in uh, Bunker Hill. Anyway, Hey Vincent, you're breaking up a lot. I, I wonder if you can turn off the camera and if that'll have a faster connection. Okay, camera's off. How's that? It's a little better. Okay, sorry about that. I'll start over. It's all right. We know you're up north, right? That's better, much better. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, I'm on a hot spot. <laughs> All right. The middle almost Sound is still really bad. Yeah, Vincent, it's cutting out a lot. He cut out. <laughs> it happens. Tech issues. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate. Vincent is a really talented poet that um, he's just amazing. I don't know him as well as you do, but I love his poetry. Um, so we don't have to talk about my, my metaphor question, but does anybody have other questions of each other or want to comment? Um, Carlos, I thought your reading was great. I would love to hear it in Spanish. So I love that last poem in particular. Um, but any, anybody else want to uh, ask questions of the poet, or maybe you've been hanging on to a question from the earlier session? Hey, Adam, can I make a random request? I was just about to answer your question. That was, oh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's your great. random request. Can you play your last release? I love that song so much. I'm telling you, know, that, it's that's so an hard. eight minute piece. You're right. I don't know about eight minute song, <laughs> but you should definitely pitch it because I sure, love, sure. I love, yeah. I love how you fuse scripture with your song, and. I listen to it almost every morning. It's become my prayer. Oh, Just beautiful. Wow. So please answer the question because you, you are a master poet in my eyes. Um, and I see you as a poetry guru. So go ahead. <laughs> that's that's too kind. Thank you, Hesu. I also see that Vince just rejoined and maybe is troubleshooting the um, connection issue. Um, but uh, I just shared a link um, to my latest release. Um, musical release in the chat, a uh, Psalm one medley. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I was gonna say that as someone who flirts with cliche quite a lot, I have some thoughts I can share on that wonderful question you asked. Um, I think there's a reason why things are cliche and it's because they're powerful that they get used so much that 
they get used so often in the same way and we hear the same words and phrases so frequently that they start to lose their power and impact, which puts the job on us poets and artists and creatives to innovate on the themes and the concepts and ideas that um, are within that realm we call cliche. And, um, you know, kind of rescue the cliche because um, a fear of being cliche is really just a fear of telling the truth, you know, which is the job of poetry and art in the first place. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should take the challenge of it seriously. Um, and a, a poem and poet who comes to mind in that light is um, Roque Dalton, um, who uh, also inspired Jack a lot. In fact, as I understand the history, the um, precursor to the Revolutionary Poets Brigade was something called the Roque Dalton Brigade, which was about um, sharing the revolutionary poetry of Roque Dal Dalton and the poets of El Salvador and of Latin America generally. Um, and uh, in, in translation, and I shared in the chat uh, that in college, before I knew anything about Jack or who he was, I had a um, translation of his from a book edited by Martina Spada, whose class I was taking. Um, and, and, and actually the name of the collection was named after this poem. The collection was called Poetry Like Bread, and uh, it's a great collection. Uh, and the poem by Roque Dalton is called um, uh, Como Tu, Like You and very much um, uh, skirts that line of cliche because Roque Dalton was also not afraid to say things that were right to the point and that were uh, at, risk, at the risk of sounding sentimental, as Che Guevara also said, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, I would say that the true revolutionary is guided by strong feelings of love. Um, we need to risk sounding ridiculous. We need to risk sounding cliche. Um, but if we have actions to back it up, and if we do the work of saying it in the most true way possible, we will push the language beyond the point where it feels cliche. Because really, that's just a feeling that we're not really, we're not really trying hard enough to say it uh, in the way that feels most aligned, right? That's beautiful, beautifully said. Um, you know, in fact, the first poem I ever heard read I was a, at a performance and a comrade of mine from college, Tony Zaragoza read Like You. And I'm telling you, I fell in love with Roque from that point on. And I heard the English version that was translated by Jack Hirschman. It was just gorgeous, you know, beautiful poem. I teach it to my students. Uh, and, and I love how they translate it in terms of how people are interconnected. But Adam, that, that was brilliant. Um, and Carlos, is, uh, is it okay with y'all if he reads one of his poems in Spanish? Yeah. Carlos, can you read the, the last one? Yes. I'm biased. I call oh. my privilege. Can you read that last beautiful piece? I love that. You want to? Whichever you, whichever you want to read, but I, I really like that one hit hard with me. You want me to read the last one I read? Yes, please, if that's okay. Okay, just to, yeah, just let me find it. And what's the name of your collection? Oh, it's, uh, it's called Antologia Chiquita. Oh. <laughs> little anthology. I love it. Yeah, just let me find it. Okay? No worries, no worries. Yeah, uh, due to Lou, um, that poem about uh, the headache and communism being the aspirin the size of the sun. Yes, on oh. headaches. On headaches, right. Hey, okay, I found it, found it. Okay. The name of the poem is uh, Que Lejos Se Ve La Patria. Que lejos se ve la patria, aperitas y con tristeza. No sabes nada de ella, ni cómo anda, ni con quién anda. Te dicen que está fea, descuidada, sin arreglo. Te dicen tantas cosas para que alimentes tus flacas penas. 
que de vez en cuando mueren atribuladas por tanta esperanza que tienes. La patria está lejos porque no hay nada malo con ella. Y por un tiempo los buitres fueron espectáculo. Por favor, haga lo posible por tenerla cerca. Muchas gracias. Damn, that's gorgeous. Yeah. I wish you could enjoy that in Spanish. So beautiful. Just great. Um, thank you. Gracias, Carlos. Uh, if my say something else, I could share my book. Okay. I could share my book because it's no longer my, uh, my publisher died last year. And oh, oh. I was told that there are no more copies. Okay. But I could share a send a PDF file to share it with everyone here. Oh, that would be sure. fantastic. If you, uh, if you can send me the file, I will distribute it to everybody who registered for this event. That's more than just the people that are here. Okay. I could send it to your uh, email. E or send it to the email, or you can put it in the chat. Yeah, that's true. Oh, no, you, no, don't put it in the chat. Send it separately on email. It's, it'll be easier if, it's, uh, if you're sending yeah. a file. Okay. Here's the email. Yes. Oh, I okay. get it. Do you have his email? Well, you have his email, right? You have his email. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so how about uh, Tristan, my sister, my brother? Do you do you have any comments or questions? I'm not to call you up, but I seen y'all there throwing hearts at us. <laughs> Points to the wife. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi. So, um, if I could share a writing I did this past year. Yeah. I'm not, I I yes. do not. I do, don't get so excited. I am not like. Please, please. Oh man, Lou. Um, this is gonna be epic. I so I we we live in Portage, Michigan. And I'm a physical therapist by trade. And for the past five years, I've been doing home, health, home visits in particular. This was written back in April. <sighs> I cried today with a new friend. She behind, <clears throat> she behind a screen three seasoned room and I masked on the other side. I cried today with a new friend, her with puffy reddened eyes and I now soaked masks upon my nose bridge. Mm. I cried today with a new friend. She with squeezed hands towards her heart and I squeezing hands to mine. I cried today with a new friend. She just feet away from his bed pet bedroom and I feet away from his new van, now a reminder of what could have been. I cried today with a caregiver. She with 20 years of service, yet without being awarded a goodbye or a last embrace. I cried today with a daughter. She with new brokenheartedness and I with new fissures in a healing heart. I cried today with a new friend, a caregiver, a daughter, us now bonded by paternal loss us now scarred deeper by this year, us now in wait for shared joy and not trauma. I cried today. Mm. That was beautiful. Oh, it's lovely. And I, yeah, I think it, it hits all of us because wow. we're all experiencing loss and trauma, you know, but that's gorgeous. Love it. Um, thank you. Can I just say, Maribeth, that that was a beautiful poem and you should totally elevate your skills. It was awesome. I'm telling you, I teach creative writing too. <laughs> yes, celebrate that. All right. Wow.
Well, I'm inclined, if there's time at the end or now or whenever, to read um, Como Tu. Oh, yes! Please. En okay. inglés y en español. Yeah, I'll do it in, in both uh, Spanish and English. It's short. I'll read it first in Spanish. Yo, como tú, amo el amor, la vida, el dulce encanto de las cosas, el paisaje celeste de los días de enero. También mi sangre bulle y río por los ojos que han conocido el brote de las lágrimas. Creo que el mundo es bello, que la poesía es como el pan de todos y que mis venas no terminan en mí, sino en la sangre unánime de los que luchan por la vida, el amor, las cosas, el paisaje y el pan, la poesía de todos. Like you, I love love, life, the sweet smell of things the sky blue landscape of January days and my blood boils up and I laugh through eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry like bread is for everyone and that my veins don't end in me but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life love, little things, landscape, and bread, the poetry of everyone. Roque Dalton, translated by Jack Hirschman. Beautiful, the best translation, I think, gorgeous. So, Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. oh no, just perfect, I yeah. love it. Okay, so there has been a request privately. Um, I don't know if our compañero is here, they're requesting to hear the poem in Turkish. He's not here anymore. Oh, he left. Next you know, time, next time. Unfortunately. Well, Lou, we're at uh, 2.47. I, I don't know if, uh, if there are no more questions. I know we're not quite at two o'clock, but we could uh, hear the last piece or how do you want to roll? I have just one thing I wanted to say. And for that sure. is, of course, is that the piece that I read by Otto Rene Castillo is from this book, Tomorrow Triumphant. I'll put that in the chat, although it won't do anybody any good since it's out of print. Um, but it was published by, uh, or it was translated by the Rokey Dalton Cultural Brigade. Um, mm -hmm. So not not just Jack, but all, but all the people who are involved in, in the Rokey Dalton culture today. Um, the other thing, since we've been talking about Haiti today, the other thing that Jack uh, uh, founded as a predecessor to the general, the Revolutionary Coast Brigade was the Jacques Roumain uh, <clears throat> um, Cultural Brigade. Jacques Roumain was a, a Haitian poet and uh, Jack was very much involved with translating Haitian Creole, uh, worked with uh, Baudiba, who was a, a uh, um, and Paul Rock, who are both, are both uh, important Haitian poets. And uh, Jacques Roumain was the youngest founder of a communist party, the Communist Party of Haiti. Back mm -hmm. in the day. Mm -hmm. Just, Interesting, interesting history. Um, so I guess uh, if if we're ready to close, I will, I'll be happy to to close out if you'd like. For sure. Just one last thing. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, oh, I, I have an open call for submissions. I own a very small charity press. Woman, one woman owned from Chicago, and the money for these anthologies go to um, Doctors Without Borders. And uh, I'm looking for poetry, art, and fiction, and it's closing out this month. And I and I send copy to as many places in the world as I can, except for India and South Africa, because they have the most punitive shipping rules. Um, so you know, set for you all. Sorry. 
Oh, Bonnie, you have a question, Miha? Yes, I do. Go ahead. I, it, it's actually a compliment to everyone whose poetry is so beautiful. But I also want to bring up the fact that the reason why I read my fallen comrade Noreen poem is because it's really dealing with what we have to live through every day. Homeless people, even our own lives. And those that are without, those are forgotten. And these poems that, that we're reading is so inspiration for who that we have performed today become the F Chicago Union of the Homeless. This poem has really, these poems have really encouraged me so much to keep going forward. And I want to thank you guys Aww. for allowing us to be a part of this. Thank you. Oh, Bonnie, all. it's always a pleasure to have you and Felipe. You're an amazing team. And I love, I love both poems. They're, they hit me hard, you know, just gorgeous. Kathy says, so glad you have a home body. Aw. And thank, thank you, you so Bye. much. It's because when you go through the struggle like Mr. Jack wrote about, he wrote about all walks of life. And that's what I love about him as a person. And I'm doing more research now that I know who really actually, you know, like I said, I go to school and some things I was informed about, but I wasn't taught well. Mm -hmm. But when you get older, you do deeper research and find out more. So I'm grateful and I want to thank you guys again for giving me this information. It helps me grow because I'm very informational and I want to be correctly correct to tell people the information that I have so I can help somebody else grow. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Bonnie. That, that's like the highest compliment, I think. All right. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. So uh, we're going to close out with a uh, a a poem by Jack, but before we do that, um, I guess uh, answer a, a question that Deborah Hines put in the uh, in the chat. We were going to have a poem read in Turkish, but unfortunately, uh, the person who read it, he read a poem uh, by Nazim Hikmet in English. And apparently, he didn't have that poem in Turkish. Um, I, I thought he was going. To... Oh, that's right. He said he had to find it on the internet or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the next time we do something like this, um, he'll he'll bring it in Turkish. I was certainly hoping to hear it myself. Um, okay. So um, I think it's probably the, uh, I, what I'm supposed to do at the end is tell you a little about the League that's hosting this event. Uh, the League is an organization of revolutionaries. It's an organization of educators. It's an organization of people that are connected to every struggle that you can possibly think of. Um, I joined the League or predecessor organizations. I became involved in the movement many years ago um, because I was in a meeting following the Chicano moratorium. Mm in Los Angeles, uh, I was in a meeting of ordinary people in East Los Angeles, which is where I live. And in that meeting, an African-American guy walks in sort of halfway in the, or after the meeting had begun and sat down um, in front of me, a couple of seats in front, sat there till the, near the end of the meeting. And then the person who was convening the meeting, Jose Duarte, uh, inv invited him to the front of the room to make a statement. He said, I'm sorry, I dozed off during the meeting. I've been, I was a, I'm a bricklayer. I came here straight from work after a 12 hour day. So I'm tired, but I felt it was important for me to be here. I come to you bringing greetings from the workers of Watts. As you may know, workers of Watts had an uprising much like you did uh, and, uh, and suffered the consequences of the police repression very much like you did just a few years ago. And we are ready to express our solidarity in any way necessary if you, if you need it. I remembered that and I didn't see him again for several years and it was Nelson Peary who was the, one of the founders of this predecessor organization, California Communist League, that I joined. 
So I've been in the movement ever since then. It's been about 19, from 1971 or thereabouts. So it's been about 50 years. Um, it's that kind of solidarity, that kind of practical activity, and that kind of vision of what the of what a working class unity can bring us that brought me to the movement and continues to bring me to the movement. And that's what the league represents. Um, that is one thing. Uh, I just want to ask people, if you're interested in finding out more about the league, you can contact us at our website, learna.org or you can contact us on the Chicago Learner Facebook page. Um, we also have a newspaper, Rally Comrades, which comes out every two months, which assesses the political situation that we're facing and tries to draw some conclusion and help guide us in the work that we're doing. Again, if you have any questions, um, anything further you wanna talk about, I'm happy to do that contact me directly if you have my email or through the learner website. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. We're going to end with a poem by Jack Hirschman, um, which was a theme for this amazing event. Stepping forward. Somebody stands up saying enough. Somebody steps forward saying basta. Steps forward, steps forward, SF, SF for San Francisco, stepping forward, this compa, this compañero, Francisco Herrera, who's begun it, this comrade in arms of the song that's going to rescue the people of this city from the brink of the brinks of the banks that are connected to the corpse of its state bone that are connected to the unreal estate bone and the private property rat bone and the rent sky high bone and the homeless go die bone and that's the working of the laws. The people's laws are human kindness and modesty among equals in loving friendship without the violence of money estranging every neighborhood and every family and every individual in every neighborhood with threats of poverty or prison or the military. The violence of money, the competitive acceptance of its brutalizations rooted in capitalism's racist economics, racist genderomics, racist culturomics is what keeps one neighborhood terrified of another. But the beginning of the recovery of our city has begun its begin. The dance of resistance and the uniting of community with community through the stepping forward of the leaders in each, socially, politically, culturally, stepping forward, SF, SF for San Francisco, joining hands in long and really revolutionary struggle to overturn a system of shallow values run by amputators of human dignity alienated of natural solidarities and galvanized by the Herrera dream, the song of Francisco Herrera to realize the People's Republic of San Francisco at last.